Hello, and thank you for joining us today. My name is Chris Hannaby, and I'm a Senior Solutions Engineer at Netlify. In this talk, we're going to take a look at some of the important things that teams need to consider when they start a new project using Next.js. We'll be looking at approaches that apply to almost any project. So this advice should be useful whether you're launching an online store, rebuilding a marketing site, or refreshing your corporate blog. All of these projects usually have some common requirements. Performance is always critical. We need to be able to handle a very large number of pages. And to provide a good solution for content editors, we'll be fetching most of the data from a headless CMS. So where should we start? Well, once we've selected some other important components of our system, like headless e-commerce provider or a headless CMS, we should begin by taking an inventory of the different type of pages that are going to make up our site. This might be done as part of the content modeling work you do when you set up your CMS, but here we're less interested in exactly what the data is, and we're more interested in where it comes from, how much there is, and how often it changes. We may, we may well go through this exercise and find that our various pages have very different requirements. For some pages, we may need to dig a level deeper, and we might find that they're actually composed of a range of different data sources that may have different requirements as well. Next.js is a hybrid framework, and it provides a range of tools to fetch data and generate pages. Once we have some understanding of the makeup of our pages, we need to start mapping those different pages to the methods that Next.js provides. Since the type of sites we're looking at have a big focus on performance and SEO, our guiding principle is going to be to try and statically generate as many pages as we can. It's important to remember that with Next.js, static generation doesn't mean that we can't build highly interactive pages like we might need for an e-commerce store, for example. Going back to our examples, let's look at these marketing pages. There aren't too many, and they aren't updated too often. That makes them an obvious candidate for static generation. Let's look at how we do that with Next.js. So to make use of static generation, we're going to fetch any data that our page needs in a function called getStaticProps. And we return that data as props that are passed to our page component. When we trigger a build, Next.js will run these functions server-side, fetch the data, and embed it in HTML pages. And those can be served directly from an edge network. This means that our content is easily discoverable by search engines, and that pages can be delivered extremely quickly when they are requested by our users. This process also generates JSON files that are used when we navigate between pages using client-side routing. We'll ignore those JSON files in future examples just to keep things simple. If we move on to our blog posts, we'll see that we have many more of these, and we definitely wouldn't want to create individual Next.js pages for each post. This is where we can make use of dynamic route parameters. For these pages, we will still use getStaticProps to fetch data, but we'll introduce another function, getStaticPaths. GetStaticPaths is used to give Next.js the list of pages that we want to generate using this particular page template. Let's look at an example. So here, we trigger a build and getStaticPaths runs server-side to fetch the list of paths. The parameters from that list are then passed to getStaticProps and the pages are statically generated just as we saw before. A user can request any of those pages, and again, they'll be served directly from the edge. Another important feature of GetStaticPaths is the fallback property. Here, we've set that to false, and that indicates that we've returned all of the possible paths and any other parameters we'd want to be served with a 404 page. If we think about building all of our blog posts, we'll see that we have thousands of pages and statically generating all of those pages might result in our build times becoming unacceptably long. This is where a recent Netlify feature, on-demand builders, can really help. On-demand builders allow us to generate certain critical pages in our main build, and then we're able to defer other pages to be generated on-demand. To use on-demand builders with Next, we start using the same approach, using get static props and get static paths. But now we'll want to only return the subset of pages that we want to include in our main build from get static paths. 
This might be some of our most popular pages, could be our most recent posts. This is something you can completely customize yourself. We also want to change the fallback property from false to blocking. Now when we kick off a build, we're going to statically generate our critical pages as we saw before, but we'll also deploy builder functions that are going to handle any of the deferred pages. Requests for critical pages will be served directly from the edge, and any requests that don't match those pages will be redirected to the builder function. The builder function runs the same code that we saw in our main build and generates those pages on demand. They get stored in the edge and returned to the browser. Those pages are cached, so any future requests for the same page is going to be served directly from the edge rather than triggering the builder. Let's take another look at our products. The overall product data looks like a perfect fit for on-demand builders. We have lots of pages, but we probably have a core set of products that receive most of our traffic, and less popular products could be built on demand. But if we look at the reviews and the inventory data, we might be worried about how often this is changing. Everything we've looked at so far requires us to rebuild the whole site for us to publish new data. And for data that changes very often, we might end up spending a lot of time rebuilding the site. So we might need a different approach. First, let's look at how we handle the reviews. It's always worth questioning how dynamic our data sources really are. If we think about reviews, they typically go through a moderation process. And this kind of acts as a natural throttle on this user-generated content. Yes, a user can submit a review at any time, but we actually only want to publish moderated reviews. And so we might do this in a batch when moderators submit a batch of reviews. We can use that data then, as we've already seen, and generate certain elements like an average rating or maybe embedding some top reviews using get static props and do this as part of our static generation process. If we have lots of reviews for products and users want to see more of those reviews, we could fetch those client side. Let's look at how we can fetch data client side in Next.js. Again, we start with this foundational approach of building as much of the page statically as we can. And we should try to use um, get static props to generate sensible placeholders for any dynamic data. This really helps reduce layout shift that could otherwise be a problem when we're using client side fetching. Then to actually fetch data client side, we can wrap any requests in a use effect hook. Next.js will only run these hooks client side after the static page has been hydrated with our React application. Here we see how we could use this approach to fetch live stock levels for our product. Next.js also supports traditional server-side rendering. In this mode, data is fetched server-side on every single request to the page. This works with Netlify 2. We deploy any pages that use get server-side props to a Netlify serverless function and these functions handle rendering the page on each request. Pages using this approach will have a much slower time to first byte than a statically generated page. Server-side rendering used to be the only feasible option for handling sites with very large number of pages, but features like on-demand builders mean that we see teams using get server-side props less and less. The last data fetching option is incremental static regeneration, or ISR. We've chosen not to fully support this at Netlify, and instead, we're investing in improving alternative approaches like on-demand builders. If you do use the revalidate property on Netlify, we will fall back to server-side rendering these pages on every single request. This probably isn't what you intended, and we recommend you mainly use the other techniques that we have looked at in this talk so far. Now let's talk about how we organize pages in a way that's going to work well with our content model that we've designed in our CMS. If we don't make some clear decisions here, it can be very easy for both content editors and developers to feel like they're fighting against their tools, and maybe even each other. Next.js uses a file-based routing system, and that maps very naturally to the pages that are output when we build our site. The first way we can use this is by defining explicit pages and directories, and we see that here on this slide. But as we saw earlier, Next also supports dynamic route parameters. There are a few variations of how you can declare these, and they all support slightly different behavior. 
First, we can have a dynamic segment, which will only match the explicit segment of the path that we've declared. We can also have a catch-all, and that's going to match the segment, but also paths deeper. And then finally, we can have an optional catch-all, which does exactly the same as the options above, um, but it will also match the uh, root of the directory that it was declared in. So how do we best combine these different options to work nicely with a CMS? The first approach is one that you'll see off, often recommended by various CMS vendors, and that's to use a root catch-all. This is going to give content editors complete control to add pages anywhere within the site, but it also gives you a single file where you need to manage all of your Next.js page-related code. We've definitely seen that this can have a maintenance cost for teams that are building larger sites. This approach also means that it's much harder to use a range of data fetching patterns across all our different pages. But it can work very well if our pages use static generation, maybe combined with on-demand builders for certain pages. The other, at the other end of the spectrum, we can define all our routes explicitly using separate pages in Next.js. This means that content editors are unable to add new sections to the site without support from developers. They can be enabled to add and remove pages to specific sections, maybe like blog posts or product pages, but they can't change the overall structure. From a developer's perspective, however, this approach can make the code base much easier to work with, and it makes um, using different data fetching patterns across our different pages much easier. So which approach is right? Using a root catch-all can be a great option for projects that are going to be delivered by an agency or some other team that won't be continuing to work on the site day to day. But a more explicit approach can be appropriate if the project has a de dedicated development team that will be working on the site full time. And it can be particularly beneficial if your individual pages are very specialized or if they involve very complex data fetching requirements. For many pro projects, the right approach will actually be used to use a combination of these techniques. That might be using explicit pages to manage some of the more complex use cases, and then a root catch-all that handles everything else. Or you can choose to define catch-alls in specific direct directories where content editors need some flexibility to or organize pages. Whichever approach you choose, the last important piece to tie everything get together is allowing content editors to represent internal links between pages by referencing other documents in the CMS. We definitely don't want content editors to have to deal at, with figuring out the correct paths for different internal links. Then to support this, you'll need to create some kind of utility function that you use in your Next.js site that is able to resolve these CMS references to URL paths in a canonical way. We'll end today with some notes on performance. By using Next.js, you get access to a great toolbox that can be used to build a very performant site. For example, Next.js gives us the ability to statically generate pages, as we've seen today. We also get automatic perk paid code splitting. So when we load the, a page, the browser will only load the JavaScript required for that particular page. And by using the Next Image component, we get easy access to a range of image handling best practices. But these things don't mean that we can completely forget about performance when we're developing a site using Next. The first step in delivering a performance site is to understand our tools. This includes Next.js itself, but also any other libraries that we may import and other third-party services that we're using at runtime. It's always a great idea to set up performance monitoring early in your development process. So you can really start to understand how the changes you're making as a developer are impacting key metrics. There are a load of great tools to help you do this. On Netlify, you can install a Lighthouse build plugin, and that's going to run checks against every single build of your site. Since this is tied to your Git commit history, this can be a great way to find the root cause of any regressions. The Chrome UX report project provides a range of tools that can be used to understand real user data once your site is live. The dashboard is particularly useful for understanding historic trends. And finally, Web Page Test is great for digging into individual pages and looking at specific optimizations using the waterfall chart. I'd also recommend installing the Next.js bundle analyzer to your project. 
that the way that Next.js allows us to write server-side and client-side for code in a single file is really great for productivity, but it can make it a little more difficult to reason about exactly what JavaScript is going to be sent to the client. The bundle analyzer is a great place to get a clear understanding of exactly what Next.js is doing with the code that you write in your pages. It's also a great tool to identify libraries that are having a particularly large footprint in your bundle. Once you've done some analysis of the potential of, of performance of your site, the potential improvements are going to be very specific to your particular site. But one area where most Next.js sites can try and optimize is by reducing the amount of JavaScript that's sent to the client. The big element of this is always going to be carefully evaluating any third party dependencies, but some next specific features to look at include next dynamic. This allows you to lazily load certain components client side, and it can be particularly useful for large components that are only needed after specific user interactions. This can have a really big impact if these components are included in your shared layout and are therefore loaded on every single page. Another option is to swap experiment with switching out React for Preact in your production builds. Preact implements most of the React APIs, but it does so in a much smaller package. This might have some compatibility issues, so it's definitely worth testing this carefully. Um, but again, this is something that impacts the bundle across all your different pages. It's also really important to remember that when you do use Next.js, even your statically generated pages are going to include some JavaScript by default. A page could be made up entirely of only HTML P tags, but it's still going to include React and it's going to be hydrated client side. So if you have some very static pages, maybe something like a blog post, you could consider completely disabling the runtime JS by including the snippet that I've shown here. You just include this in the specific pages where you want to disable JavaScript. This can have a big performance impact, but it does mean you can't use Next.js, certain Next.js features like the client-side routing. And finally, if performance is one of your main considerations, it's seriously worth evaluating other frameworks alongside Next. Some frameworks that give you more control over your client-side JavaScript include Eleventy, which is a really popular option, and a newer framework, Astro, is doing some really interesting work that enables a more HTML-first approach that ships zero JavaScript by default. It uses a JSX-like syntax, and it supports partially hydrating individual components from React, but even other frameworks like Vue or Svelte. Thanks so much for joining. You should be able to find me in the chat if you have any questions that you want to ask, and please do reach out. And if your team is working on an important Next.js project, we'd love to hear from you at the link that's shown on the screen. I hope you enjoy the rest of the event and have a great day.